This is Linux Unplugged, episode 22, for January 7th, 2014. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's still airing out the studio after a power supply failure. My name is Chris. <laughs> My name is Matt. And when I say failure, I mean of the most dramatic kind. I, I Last night, I was Fire. repurposing uh, an old studio Hackintosh, which is a pretty nice rig, Core i7, uh, has about 16 gigabytes of RAM, SSDs, and wow. I swapped out an ATI, like, 590 and something. And I put in a GTX 780, and uh, I was going to wipe it, pave it, and make it a dedicated Linux workstation for trying out a bunch of stuff with uh, the NVIDIA card and whatnot. And I get it all hooked up, and it's running pretty good, and I go to reboot it because I've got, I'm going to go Integro, so I figure. I've got the Integro yeah, right. ISO burnt to my DVD. I put it <laughs> in the drive, it boots up, and I notice the lights in my house, in my room, start to flicker a little bit. I'm like, geez, this thing doesn't have that much power. So I shut off some gear. Lights are still kind of flickering. I'm like, gosh, that's really strange. And then all of a sudden I start hearing this. Oh, no. And it almost sounded like water. And I look over the back of the PC. And because of where the fan was positioned in the power supply, the smoke is just billowing out. And it just oh, an no. insane rate. And it immediately starts stinking in here just horribly, right? And so thankfully, I mean, this isn't my first time. I, I've seen a power supply fire before. So I, I, don't, I don't panic or anything. But I... I try stupidly tried turning off the PC by hitting the power button. <laughs> yeah, that, that ship sailed already. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, oh yeah, dummy. So then I just reach over and I kill the power at the uh, at the uh, uh, surge protector. But the problem is right. the smoke is just going now, right? The components have melted. Oh, yeah. They're going like crazy. And so I sit there from I have a moment of hesitation. I'm like, well, do I just let this? I know it's not on fire anymore, but there's going to be a lot more smoking. Do I leave it in my office and close up all the doors and then just say goodbye to my office for a couple of days, or? Do I rush this thing through the house, smoke and tail, <laughs> oh, and then no, put it no. out on the front porch? And I, I opted to go that route because this because I was just like, I got to have my office back to do the shows. Right. And I rushed it out and put it on the front porch. <laughs> and then I like had to abandon the office for the rest of the evening because it was just so strong. Man. And it's funny because my son's coming down the stairs. And the first thing he says, and because I'm talking to Angela about what just happened because yeah, it all happened man. so fast. And he's coming down the stairs and he goes... <laughs> Oh, it smells really good in here. I like that. What are you cooking, Dad? I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then by the time he gets to the bottom of the stairs, he's like, oh, that smells horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of a crazy. And so now I'm out my, I was going to build this awesome Linux workstation because uh, as we're, as we move to uh, the new studio in March, um, we're going to be redoing all the computer layouts. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to get myself set up with a nice Linux workstation at the new studio. I'll, I'll get it all loaded up with Arch and Steam and all that kind of stuff. And I'll have an HDMI feed to the live stream so I can right. do some, you know, uh, Let's Plays just on the stream when I want. So I'm getting this thing all configured, like with all these hopes and dreams, and then boom, fire happens. And now all of the components of the computer just reek. And the brand new uh, GTX 780 I got totally smells to high hell. And, <laughs> and this was like one of these purchases I get where I'm like, well, you know what? It's it's 2013. If I buy this right now, I'm going to use it in the new studio. This is going to be a tax write-off. Right. You would so, think, yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. So now I'm now I'm worried that like when I fire up that graphics card, if it still works after a power supply freak out like that, you know, the components could be damaged and that's a really high voltage piece of equipment. So that if anything's going to get damaged, it's going to be that. And so it could be totally fried now. I don't know. But I don't want to plug it in anything because I'm worried it's going to fire it up and make the whole room stink all over again. So... Well, that's when you take it to a Starbucks, you know, yeah. and you just set yourself up on a table. I, I'm a real jerk, you can tell. Yeah. You go to somewhere you don't really have anything invested into it, you know, whatever, yeah. and then just act all surprised when it catches on fire. Yeah. yeah. No, the chat room thinks it was Integros' <laughs> fault. No, it was it was probably putting, switching ATI to NVIDIA. It was like. putting the, uh, well, yeah, you know, probably the video cards pulling more yeah. power. Although this is a high-end 1,000-watt power supply because I got a really good one because it was the Wirecast machine, and it ran 24-7, and it was our production machine. So I put... Like I went high end components in all of it, and so, I wonder but, if it's still under warranty because that sounds kind of messed up. But yeah. you know how we were having problems with that Hackintosh? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. This yeah. might this power supply might have been failing for a while. Now that I think about it. Oh, that one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That could be why. Yeah. That could so be why. I'm I'm wondering, and and so I think mm. what happened was is when I put the blank, D, or when I put I was going to burn a DVD, 
and I put it in the drive, and I think just spinning up the optical media was just the straw that broke the power supplies back, and right. there you had it. Jeez, jeez. Yeah, well, I'm glad no one was hurt. And uh, yeah, just a um, stinkiness. Nothing. A too good bad. call on taking it outside, opening up a window is a fast track to getting the fire department called on you. <laughs> I know. Well, that's what you know. I was worried. <laughs> I've, been, like, I've been there myself. I actually had that happen once. All with the, the uh, all the smoke detectors here are connected, so I was a little worried that yep. uh, yeah, that it, the whole house would start buzzing like crazy, and didn't want that either. Um, yeah, usually there's like a th- I think it's like a three second delay, and then it's like at least at ours anyway, it's the same thing, and then it's like after three seconds, it's all over. They're all going off. Yeah, I wanted to play Steam. All right, well, uh, <laughs> I got some feedback to get to. Uh, Noah wrote in uh, so with some follow-up to our predictions episode that we had uh, a ways mm-hmm. back. Now, uh, before I get to this, I want to just mention for people who maybe have just uh, started listening to Linux Unplugged, uh, one of the things that we do here on this show is we do follow-up to the big show, Linux Action Show, which gets so much email that we just simply cannot get to it all. So a lot of times in this follow-up section we'll cover uh we'll pick up on threads that were started in the last and this here from noah is is one of those exact threads uh so noah writes in he says uh, in the predictions episode you talked about the death of microsoft let me start out and say i do not believe this will be happening anytime soon i think Al- alan mulally will become the ceo of microsoft and will think the open source closed argument is similar to the two nerds is similar to two nerds sitting in a room debating Batman versus Superman. I think Mulally <laughs> will make a new structure for Windows. The basic version of Windows will be based on an open operating system that relies on a central server to operate the machine, similar to how Chromebooks rely on Google for services. Mm-hmm. Then I think Microsoft will release a pro version of Windows that really will be closed and have all the goodness slash badness Windows currently has. Here's the twist. In an enterprise environment, basic workers will have the basic version of Windows, while IT admins will have top and top-level execs will have the pro version. This pro version will give them tools to control and monitor the basic versions of Windows. Everything from various levels of access to automatically generate reports on productivity based on time spent on certain apps. This will give Microsoft a competitive advantage over their newest business enemy, Google. This, is all, this also allows Microsoft to further push Office into the subscription service because basic users will have to pay to have an advanced feature not offered in web apps. Don't get me wrong. I'm far from a Microsoft lover. Mm-hmm. I deep down wish LibreOffice and OpenSUSE could make this happen, and ultimately the Linux user space is more concerned with defining what is good and what isn't good for the Linux community. Who knows? Maybe I've just had one too many bottles of New Year's cheer. Anyways, <laughs> thanks to you and Angel and the rest of the JB team for bringing the highest quality content any nerd could hope for. Just remember, every week you make a nervous Windows user a little less scared of switching to Linux. Happy 2014. Nice, nice. Yeah, I actually agree with them for two reasons. One, they they are basically pushing my argument for Microsoft's remaining an enterprise uh, situation. That's true. They're, they're excellent for that. And I would say that they will continue to own the American enterprise situation they will not under any circumstances be doing wondrous things overseas i i just don't i I, I could see that i could see that but Um, american yeah i think that's true so one thing that is really prevalent right now not talked a lot about is a lot of our apps that we use on mobile devices have in some cases literally google analytics but in a lot of cases there's a lot of different analytics companies that are really actually tracking all your activity in these apps to a great extent now Mm -hmm. it varies of course depending on the app and the developer but they can get down to how much time you spend in a particular function of the app, what other apps you switched from, the location, the geolocation, you ran it from the Wi-Fi network, all these things, the time you spent doing different things in the app. Wouldn't it be interesting, like uh, like he's saying here, wouldn't it be interesting for Microsoft to say, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going we're gonna to take those kinds of analytics, and because we're appifying the desktop, we're going to apply that kind of analytics at the enterprise space. And just like where you go into group policy and you set enterprise-wide policies for Windows machines and Active Directory where you set enterprise-level access controls, and the event log where you can have, well, not really centralized logging like you get with syslog, but you can have logging and event log. This could be one more thing that sits on top of that Microsoft Active Directory stack is these, in, uh, these, these analytic tools pointed back in at the user and provided to the company instead of provided to some sort of third party. And I think that would be compelling for places that are horrible, draconian places to work for. Yeah. Uh, you know, this would be great for the office space type corporation. However, I don't, first of all, believe it's going to be Malali. He's currently working at Ford and he's definitely at retirement age. And second of all, I think that would require such a level of insight and vision into the computer industry. It would. That I just can't, I mean, I just can't see it happening unless there was somebody that that brought this forward from within Microsoft to Mulally and he then gave it the okay. But, well, I think and if you look at something like Yahoo, here's an example. If they took a superstar from Google, dropped her in, very, very talented, amazing talent, amazingly talented person who, despite having all this amazing talent, has really done 
not been able to do squat to really turn Yahoo around. The, Yahoo still doesn't know if it's a search engine or a directory or what the hell they are. They're, they're still or all a over media the map. company now. or a media company or an AOL. Yeah, because you know they got the whole AOL thing going. I mean, they're, they're all over the map. So I think Microsoft suffers from the same thing. I think their stuff is so deeply rooted down to the core that bringing in a new talking head isn't going to solve any problems for them at all. Yeah, yeah, and they, I just you don't. Know, Unfortunately, they are a company that has been ran by a, by a sales team for a very yeah. long time now, and they would do good to get some engineers behind the reins. Um, and I don't—I mean, Malali is an old school engineer. I'll give him that, but I—I just—I don't see it. I think the big problem they've suffered from is somebody who doesn't have great insights into the industry as a whole. Right. That's uh, it. So uh, um, I have—I uh, have some more feedback to get to. Let's see here. Um, Boy, we had a lot of stuff on the gnome on the on the gnome in the oh, yeah. gnome thing. Yeah. I think what I want to do is I want to cover a, a bit of late breaking news. We don't normally cover uh, breaking news on the Linux Unplugged show, but this just happened about an hour ago, and I it's it's huge. So I want to talk about that because um, I, we'll we'll definitely cover it more in last. But since it just happened, I just want to let I want to get people uh, aware of it. But before we get to that. I want to thank Ting.com, sponsor of Linux Unplugged. Ting is mobile that makes sense, and Ting also offers you some great devices with some amazing rates. You only pay for what you use with Ting. It's $6 a month for a phone, and then it's whatever usage, your minutes, your megabytes, and your messages on top of that. Ting is my mobile service provider. Ting is Matt's mobile service That's provider. Right. And, you know, I don't know if you recall, Matt, but um, a few weeks back, I think it was December, they were doing uh, a survey where if you're on AT&T or Verizon and you took a survey and did their uh, savings calculator, it wasn't even a survey, it was just their savings calculator, uh, you would be entered to win a free cup of coffee. Oh, I remember that. That, yeah. was, a, that was actually really popular. It was so, pretty cool. Ting is a very transparent company, and this is one of the things I like a lot about them as uh, I'm, th- I really pride myself on trying to research and, and understand the companies that I, I spend my money with. And so I, I really like this aspect of Ting. And one, so they're sharing some of the data they got from those uh, uh, savings calculator from the, uh, from the coffee survey. And here's, here's what some of the results are. 92% of participants would see some savings in their monthly bill. 87 would save more than $350 over two years, enough to basically pay for a Nexus 5. 82% <laughs> would save more than $600 over two years. Uh, now, here's what's really crazy is when you are a small business, say like around 10 devices, 100% of the small businesses with 10 devices saved money on their monthly bill with Ting. That's crazy. So it literally now Ting is validated from two different companies oh. that uh, that 98% of the people who switch to Ting save money. And this is something, as we move forward with computing devices that are in our pockets uh, we are really going to enter an age where companies are going to try to take advantage of us. And we already are seeing this with the existing incumbent carriers who are big, maybe, you know, duopoly type uh, situations here in the U.S. Uh, and it's really not in their interest to be customer focused, where it is specifically by the way Ting is structured as an MVNO that is in their core business DNA to focus on customer service. Right. And as an end result, it really shows from the dashboard, from the fact that if you call them at one 846 4389 anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., a real person answers the phone, usually like on the first ring, resolves your problem, is empowered to solve the issue, gives you their, num- their name, their number right then and there. And this is also why Ting makes their savings calculator available to you. They're just going to put it right up front. Plug in your minutes used, your text message, your megabytes, your total bill before taxes, and they'll calculate what your savings could be with Ting. And to help you switch over to Ting, they have an early termination relief program over at ting.com slash ETF. Check this out. You pick your Ting phone, you port your number over, and then you submit your ETF claim to Ting, and they'll give you up to $75 per line that you have to cancel. That eases that transition over to buying a device that you own outright. It's not something you're financing from the carrier. It's your phone. You own it. And you're only paying for what you use. This is why I I literally, I literally went from about $120 a month on my phone bill to I average around $25, $30 now. It's it's amazing, awesome. and that is enough money that it actually makes a difference for me every single month. So here's how you get started. Go to linux.ting.com. That'll take $25 off your first device, or if you already have a Sprint-compatible device and you want to bring it, just check their compatibility page, and if you've got that device, they're going to take $25 off your first month. That might just pay for your first month of service over at Ting. So linux.ting.com to get started, and a huge thank you to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Oh, All right. Definitely. So before we get to any more of the feedback, I, I want to cover this big story that just broke. Uh, CentOS is joining forces with Red Hat. It's um, it's through uh, acquisition of talent. 
It's uh, it's going to be uh, core members of the CentOS team joining Red Hat. Now, they're not going to be working for the Red Hat Enterprise Linux division, interestingly enough. And as they put it, the new initiative is going to be overseen by a new CentOS governing board. The initial board will comprise of the existing CentOS core team members. And also, they're going to add new members, uh, one nominated from the community and three members that were nominated by Red Hat directly, which I thought is kind of interesting. They said uh, further, further down the road... Uh, the CentOS Linux platform won't be changing. The process and methods built around the platform, however, are going to become more open and more inclusive because now that they're working directly with Red Hat Legal, they're going to be able to p- clear some hurdles like doing Q&A out in the public and things like that. Uh, so there's a lot of good, interesting things. There are some things that are going to be changing, but I think I th- the bulk I think this of that could be a real out. stepping stone for them. I think this could definitely be kind of that uh, – someone said legitimizes them. I think it's more – it adds to their credibility but and just expands on what they're already doing that's awesome. You know, I don't know if legitima- legitimize might be a little strong, but yeah, I'll tell I agree. you, I watched CentOS from the beginning um, and um, Scientific Linux and other ones too. Mm-hmm. And I know early on when uh, I had a customer who had Red Hat Enterprise Linux, there was selling on my part – to convince them that it was, it was even okay to try CentOS on the testing machines, then right. let alone a whole other round of selling I had to do to get them to try it on production. Where now, everyone who made a bet on CentOS, and, and for some of them, there might have been just a little wiggle of doubt in the back of their mind, oh, this isn't a legitimate copy of Red Hat Enterprise Linux or whatever, which even though it's, you know, technically exactly the same, uh, that doubt now is completely washed away. Everybody who had made an investment in CentOS on their server farms right now, all of the hosting companies, all of the small businesses and large businesses that have CentOS deployed, this is a huge validation for that deployment. And that just gave them a huge peace of mind, I would think. If, if I was still running a bunch of CentOS servers, I would be very pleased with this news. I would think so. So I'll be curious to see where it goes. We'll follow, uh, we'll follow this story throughout the week, and if there's further developments... Well covered on, in Sunday on the on the Linux. Action yeah, I think show. it's still pretty early. Yeah, we'll definitely kind of have to see where it all yeah. translates it into. Literally, just happened. Yeah. yeah. So it is very early. Uh, okay. So we talked about GNOME three on Linux Action Show on Sunday, and uh, oh, geez, Reddit isn't working right now. Lots of feedback. Lots of feedback in the Reddit thread that we do every episode of Linux Action Show <laughs> gets tossed in LinuxActionShow.reddit.com where people can comment and give us feedback on it. There were so many good ones in there. Um, but you know what? Reddit is totally down right now, like a clown. Oh, it oh, is. There I'm, it goes. There no, it goes. I was to say I got it running. I was getting the I was getting the piled. Uh, the dude gets piled on. You know what I'm saying? No, oh, yeah. It's like too many upvotes. Reddit alien had a fit. <sighs> Reddit, get your crap together. Gosh, I'm sure. Jeez, cloud stuff. I, I, I I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So there's so many in here. I'll link to the whole thread in the show notes. But I did pull out a couple. Uh, Weem Wem wrote in. He says my main problem with GNOME three. Which it's always, which has always been, is removing core functionality and then expecting it to be implemented uh, as a user-developed extension. This is bad. I'm sorry. It just is. This is a point we heard a lot. I don't know if I agree with it, but a lot of people made this point, and he just summed it up really good. So I highlighted his. Um, so, for example, like the minimize button, right, or, or, huh? or certain things that have been taken out that you then have to go back through some other third-party method to get that functionality back. What's your take on that, Matt? Boy, you know, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm going to really kind of have to wait and see where everything ends up in the long, in the long haul. But right now, I just feel like it still needs a little more time in the oven. I like, I like the overall aesthetic direction they're going, but I feel like there's just certain little bits of functionality that, uh, while extensions do address them, and so do the great tools like the configuration tools they offer, I just feel like that you know i don't want to rush to judgment but i definitely feel like i'm not ready to make that permanent switch yeah, i yet. think that's fair i think it that, is yeah, kind of still kind of early days for me i like riding that uh that that early wave of of these desktop stuff it's always kind of been one of the one of the most entertaining aspects of using linux for me is being right there on that edge um and so uh, i see it where it's at now and I've, i so i've kept using it I, I thought maybe i might go back to kde but i kept using it after uh the linux action show and uh, gosh i'm now, I, really, see, I, can I use, really like I can, it. I can use GNOME over KDE because, I mean, there's other desktops out there, of course, you know, that I, that I enjoy. But So I, I would say at this point I could see myself using GNOME over KDE, but at the same time, uh, you know, yeah. on an older machine, it's still bloated. Uh, I'm sorry it is. I mean, just factually speaking, if you run it on an older machine, it definitely feels bloated. Here's um, a, here's on a new machine, one. it's fine. But. What do you think of this one? Uh, so, uh, Obermeiser was writing, he says, working, uh, working dual displays across four virtual desktops and then apps remembering size and position for me is a serious requirement for integrations and productivity. I find it annoying that opening up six to 12 apps across virtual desktops, 
Uh, it's it's annoying and unproductive. I'm surprised by it being a non-issue with the user base out there. What he's talking about is like under uh, KWIN or KDE, it will remember the position of a window, whereas right. GNOME and GTK take the point that, well, this is up to the application to store the position and then restore itself to that position. Well, and see, for myself, it's like, okay, so you have your virtual desktops. And then, of course, you, you oftentimes a lot of people have dual monitors or maybe even more than that. Um, I run everything full screen. And so, you know, I'm doing side by side with whatever I'm working on in one in one uh, workspace, and then if I need to switch to another virtual desktop, I do. No big deal. Crazy, you know. I've and so I just full desktop. I just it's just never been a thing for me. One of the yeah. one of the bits of feedback we got uh, on the GNOME three stuff is if you want a tip for working with GNOME three is every time you decide to start a new task or open a new window, put, yeah. move it to a, its own virtual desktop. So don't think of virtual desktops as just a, a spot to store a new window. But every time you begin a new activity. You, you 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 instead of opening a new window you move it you open it to a, in a new virtual space and so mm-hmm. I've been trying this even like with uh, with like multiple w- uh, web browsers so right. I had a, I have the email up in web, one web browser and I have the the Slexi paste bin uh, site up in another browser and so I, I highlight the email in one and I just I slide down and I paste it and it actually has been working quite well for me so I'm going to continue right. to try that out instead of having a bunch of windows on one virtual desktop because what I've always done before is this is my web browsing virtual desktop. This is my email and IM virtual desktop. This is my right. terminal virtual desktop. And it's always been very structured in my mind. And now I'm going to do it more just based on, hey, I need a task. So I'm just going to create, create a virtual desktop. Because he pointed out in GNOME 3, you can, you can create and destroy virtual desktops at whim, just like you can open and close windows. So there's no oh, yeah. real disadvantage to doing it. Yeah, exactly. That's that's really it. And I mean, a lot of people think, well, why the hell would you run everything full screen? I mean, for myself personally, it just comes down to usability. I don't I, I'm very, very easily distracted, so I don't want a lot of crap on the same mo- on the same yeah, screen. Yeah, I have monitor. noticed actually. I can't deal with that. It is easier to focus, mm-hmm. especially for videos and chat rooms oh, and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, all right, well, one little bit of uh, news that just broke too, and we're going to be covering it way more in Linux Action Show on Sunday. We'll be covering all of the best of Linux. It's already first day of CES. <laughs> it's already been a blowout uh, for Linux there. Um, WebOS made a uh, made a comeback. Uh, Intel has an amazing SD sized x86 PC that runs Linux, and oh, yeah. the, and Valve has demonstrated showed off some of their new Steam boxes. And Matt, we're seeing Steam boxes from mm-hmm. Alienware, Alternet, um, iBuyPower, CyberPower PC, and they are looking amazing. Well, and if you think about it, especially with uh, Falcon Northwest and Alienware, those are probably my two favorite examples. Um, these are people that are being told over and over, oh, the desktop's going to die and it's all about mobile. This is their bread and butter. So they're they're not only embracing this right. as an opportunity to show folks that it's not dead, that they can, in fact, ad- adapt and evolve, but in the fact that it can actually be really awesome. And I think, I think it's going to be really exciting to see how some of these machines perform. Gigabyte is showing uh, one that does use Iris graphics, so that might be a limiting factor. Mm-hmm. But it's like sure. I think they're talking four hundred dollars or something. Yeah, I mean so they've it's a got little the high still, but cr- cra- yeah, they're a little bit high. But I mean they got the lower end machines to the crazy. Yeah. What one yep. was like between seventeen and six thousand? Yeah, uh, or yeah, six thousand bucks. You can go something. real hardcore. Yeah, mm. and I'd uh, love that one. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> I'll tell you what uh, I have seen. So one that I, I thought was really compelling was one that actually mounts behind the TV. Oh. And it has a, it has a rack and it slides out. There's. There's been some really interesting uh, Steam boxes showing off. So, pretty. Oh, hey, that's the that, is that video card right there in the picture is the one I installed in the uh, computer last night that caught on fire. Someone needs to Photoshop fire on that. Yeah, yeah no kidding. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. really, so far it's been a great CES for Linux. So I'm I'm looking forward to our CES chat. Well, and I like so. the variety. I think that's like my number one thing that I'm really most excited about. It. Even if you're not a gamer, you have to appreciate the fact that they are bringing back the desktop at some yeah. level. Yeah, um, there, you know, various forms. And it's it's so cool to see these different takes on it. Like uh, Falcon Northwest is doing like a very cool paint job on the side mm-hmm. of the case, oh, yeah. and there's so many different uh, um, approaches to this problem. Uh, I I think this is gonna be awesome. I think it's gonna be really cool to watch. Great opportunity. Yeah. Now I just want one. Valve. Yeah. Right. I just yeah. want to remind Valve that uh, Matt and Chris are within uh, a, a couple hours at Matt. Uh, not even that of driving distance. Just we will drive to you guys. Let me put that out there. We will literally. We will bring you lunch. Yep. We whatever you want. We will dress up like butlers and serve you. I mean, whatever you need. Just let, let us hook up with one of these. Man, you're always throwing in the dress up stuff. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's like I got like Valve cosplay, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> I don't even know how that works. So, Dress uh, up like a PC. One more bit of feedback or follow up I want to get to <laughs> is we talked about the AC or you see you see uh, Pi the turnkey Raspberry Pi based internet search engine that Q5 Systems started a Kickstarter for. Uh, he's got 44 backers as uh, we record this episode, and 
he joins us right now in the mumble room. Mr. Q5, how would you say the Kickstarter is going? Are you pleased? I am very pleased. I at no point expected to be at almost 25% within three days. Uh, the wow. response has been fantastic. So I think, you know, that reason is because I would guess the re- for the same reason you started doing this, why did you want to make uh, you see more accessible to people? What's your motivation there? As you've talked about on, on Linux Action Show and with Linux Unplugged about bringing these services that we've kind of allowed other people to take care of for us, to bring them back into house, um, that's been something that's you know been of, of a lot of interest to me. And also just the privacy aspect that it gives a user to be able to do searches locally and not have you know Big Brother or Google or Bing sitting there cataloging everything you're, every single thing that you're searching. Sure, sure. And now, so um, uh, why make it turnkey? Just so that it's the simplest possible implementation for someone who's not extremely technical oriented. Um, to, to set up Yasi, it takes some configuration. You've got to work to find what the best settings are going to be. And there's a lot of people that I know would like to use software like this, but don't have the technical prowess to be able to set it up themselves. This way, everything's done. They get the item. They plug it in. They're good to go. Now, right. they, may have to set, they may have to set a port on their local router. Um, so that the actual unit can talk out to the rest of the network, but that they can do just in their um, basic router settings. I guess my first question when I saw this is, is the Pi powerful enough to uh, pull this off? Has it got enough juice? To do searches, yes, it has enough juice. To do searches and also crawl and index the web, no, it doesn't. Um, The Raspberry image, which is what most people have been using for running Yasi on Pis in the past, um, Raspberryan is a great release. It's a great distribution, but it has a lot of overhead because it's intended to be a full-fledged OS for everything. So you can get it and you can run an entire full-built uh, Linux distribution on your Raspberry Pi. What I am doing is I've built a custom Puppy Linux ARM release specifically for the task of running Yasi. So it does not have any of the extra overhead or anything else that it doesn't need. Ah. It's as trim and as slim down as possible so that it can achieve the goal and nothing more. Very nice. And nice. so I've, I've got this picture up on the uh, stream of uh, your little Raspberry Pi cluster that you're testing different images on. And what are you kind of doing to, to, to test the performance of it here? Um, I've got several different builds of the ARM release of Puppy Linux itself, um, testing different variants of, you know, compiling BusyBox and seeing, okay, well, can I get better performance if I use, if I compile it with certain options and not other options? Um, using um, the Debian RML uh binaries, just kind of picking through which ones are going to be the best for what I need. Um, and then once that's set up, testing, you know, just basic one job implementation and seeing, okay, which of these, you know, OS setups works the best. And then the next deck I'm going to go to is to figure out what's the best Java choice to use, because mm. there are several that we can do. Mm. Um, and then once that's chosen, then take the next step of, okay, what's the best way to configure the actual settings within Yasi so that the performance is the most stable? Wow. And so uh, do you, I mean, are you hoping to sort of raise awareness of the Yasi project with this too? Because I think a lot of people are seeing this and they're going, well, maybe I'll just roll this myself. Are you okay with that outcome? Actually, I am perfectly fine if the campaign is a failure. It does not bother me. <laughs> if this gets word out about the Yasi network and it gets people interested in it and it gets people actually deploying it, whether it's on laptops, their home, whether they get like a digital ocean VPS, you know, a little $5 a month instance and throw it up. Um, as long as it brings higher visibility to the project, I will be happy. This is probably a great use um, for a, a digital ocean VPS, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. I think it is. I know. Have you, uh, have you considered, uh, reaching out to the, uh, you see project and saying, Hey, are you guys cool with this? Or have they talked to you? I've actually was contacted by a Michael Christian, who is the maintainer of the Yasi project. Um, got a message from him today, had a couple emails back and forth. Um, he is totally on board with it. Um, you know, he said, you know, I hold on, let me see if I can actually pull it up real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. Hold on a second. So that's I great. was actually in the middle of emailing back. <laughs> I wonder if he oh, he must have you no. Know, I mean, maybe he was watching last. Maybe he's a viewer. Maybe been. Yeah. You never know. Hey, you hey, never know who's watching. Possibly. You never know. Well, hello if he's a viewer. All right. Uh, All right. So we got forty four right. backers. Uh, there's forty two days left to go, folks. If you want to uh, to pledge, we'll have a link in the show notes to this, and or you could go over to a Kickstarter and search for Y A C Y Pi, 
And, okay, uh, I have the email up yeah, right now. Yeah, um, cool. it, it goes on, and in part of it, he was, there's already been discussion if, you know, Yassi Pi, my project, is good or bad for the Yassi, you know, network. Um, and if a production of commercial Yassi type products are liked or disliked by me or the other developers. He said, let me c- clear this out right now. I like the Yassi Pi project, and I am happy to support you. Awesome. Um, and I right. responded back to him. I said, look, my goal is not to actually start producing these commercially and selling them. The... Kickstarter campaign is to help defer the development costs of actually being able to do this. Once that's done, the SD card image will be completely released freely. Um, they will have a copy of it. It'll be on SourceForge. I'll have it on the actual uh, website. Um, so anyone can then at that point go get the SD card image, burn it onto their own SD card if they have a Raspberry Pi, and go. That's awesome. Um, that my awesome. goal is not to make money off of this. It's to raise awareness and to get the tools into people's hands so that it can actually be used. Well, you are a gentleman, sir. Uh, I uh, I have been uh, I've been borrowing, quote unquote, a, a, a really nice, not just the Raspberry Pi, but also uh, an HP dock that uh, was made for the Atrix. I think it was like way back in the day. And so I've I've been experimenting with different uses for the Raspberry Pi, and I think if you know if you get that performance spot in there, that is perfect for a device like this. It's essentially a search appliance for your house. Yeah. Awesome. All right, well, uh, Mr. Q5, is there anything else you want to share with us before uh, we go back on to other business? Not really, just I hope that, uh, you know, anybody who is listening to this or is, you know, considering it, um, if you don't have the money to donate, that's okay. Just instead help spread the word. Well, good work. And I think it's awesome you'll be releasing the image if we if we reach that goal, too, because then other folks who already have the pie can take advantage of it. So and there are there are also if you don't have a pie yet he's got backing levels which will get you like a complete solution and you just take it and go. So, well, good work, sir. And uh, stay stick around if you'd like and uh, join us for uh, the rest of the discussion here in a moment. Yeah, congratulations uh, on the progress so far. That's really awesome. Yeah, yeah, that is really great. So I want to take a moment and uh, thank our second sponsor this week. And that speaking of DigitalOcean, we were just talking about them. Is DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can create a server in fifty five seconds, and pricing plans start at only five dollars per month. 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer for that $5 a month. DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, and Amsterdam. The interface is simple, and it has an intuitive control panel, which power users can replicate on a large scale with an API. And DigitalOcean also offers a vast collection of tutorials in their community section, and users can submit articles. And if DigitalOcean publishes that piece, 50 bones, folks. You'll get $50 from DigitalOcean. Uh, You can get uh, the link to it. More info about that in our show notes. Now, here's the thing. You guys get to be part of the hip club. We got a special thing. We still, we're still using the special promo code from last month. Now, I know you're going to think, but Chris, this is January. Trust me, dear viewer, listener, I know that. But I like every now and then to get you guys in on the club. You know, we like to sometimes stick it to the man, right? Well, guess what? You can still use Linux Unplugged December when you're over DigitalOcean, and you'll get a $10 credit, and you can try out that $5 machine for two months for free when you use the promo code Linux Unplugged December. I want to recommend you do it. And you know, uh, Q5 Sys kind of inspired me. I kind of want to go uh, throw, uh, you see, on my uh, DigitalOcean droplet, or maybe spin up another one. Hey, I'd pay $5 a month for my own totally private, completely self-controlled search. I think that's totally worth it. Oh, definitely. Uh, Jeez, I I think I'm going to do this. I mean, I think that's a great idea. So DigitalOcean has all kinds of great uh, technologies. KVM for the virtualization, SSD hard drives for the speed, amazing hardware, flexible API, great bandwidth. And of course, they also offer incredible pricing. You can get a $5 a month machine, 512 megs of RAM, a core, one core processor, 20 gig SSD, one terabyte of transfer. You go up to $10, then you get a gig of RAM, you get 30 gigs of storage and two terabytes of transfer. You go up to $20, it's two gigabytes of memory, two cores of CPU, 40 gigabyte SSD, and three terabytes of transfer, and, and on and on and on. They also offer hourly pricing if you just need to do a little testing. If you're working on a web app and you want to have your client take a look at it, you want to have a few folks just do some Q&A or maybe some critiquing for you, you could toss it up on a DigitalOcean droplet, turn it on, and then you just pay by hour, and the rates are absolutely, I mean, nobody beats these rates. It's awesome. So go over to digitalocean.com and use our special limited time promo code Linux Unplugged December to get that $10 credit. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Oh, definitely. Those guys are so awesome. I love the fact that you can just basically run it any way you want. You know, they don't treat you like you don't know what you're doing. You just get a blank box and you get to go for it. Absolutely. I love I love the droplets and I love having root yeah. access on my machine. I mean, that's a huge deal for me. 
All right. Uh, so I want to open this up to discussion here with the Mumble Room. Last week, I asked the question, does does open source governance by um, consensus of the community inhibit innovations? And where I'll point this, I'll point out a couple of things. What we're watching happening right now, for me, seems to be a great example of this with Debian. Uh, they're down the path now of choosing something besides Systemd, primarily because they are concerned about portability to the BSDs. Even though, according to the voluntary um, survey, hardware software survey for Debian users, only 0.8% of Debian users would be affected, or it's, it might even be less than that. It is it is an infinitesimal small portion of the Debian community that would be impacted by the switch to System D. But the switching of to System D would be, I would see the positives of that would be uh, much more interoperability with Linux at a lar- at a larger scope. So I look at this and I think if this was, for example, if they had a Mark Shuttleworth or they had a Steve Jobs or they had a who uh, uh, you know uh, a Larry Page, whoever sitting at Debian who was responsible for making these decisions, he would look at this and he would say, hey, you know what? Portability is great. It's something to aspire to, but let's be practical and let's get real here. We have to make a competitive product that a lot of people can use that'll you know that'll stay relevant in 2015, 2016, and beyond. Let's go this direction. And I feel like that would be, I actually feel like that's the most, it, it is so blatantly obvious that's the way to go, that the only reason we're not going that way is because the way community works is a small minority, if they push the right buttons and if they're vocal enough, can influence the herd into a, into a, a certain direction where all of a sudden it, it becomes a sacred cow to sacrifice portability. You, you, that's, that's Debian's core vision. You can't sacrifice portability. <laughs> you can't do that. And if really, yeah. if you took a rational look at it, and if somebody who was a leader, a dictator, if you, will, if you will, or a benevolent overlord, looked at it and said, come on, this is just not practical. It's not tenuable. Let's get real here. I, Chris, feel, like, I feel like that's what would happen. Yeah, go ahead. I beg to disagree there. Do it. Because first... Um, it might seem a bit uh, weird that Debian has such a strong feeling about its principles, but that's just it, principles. Openness, diversity, and nobody knows what the future will hold. Is it principles and or is it almost like, a, well, we don't want to, we want to tell ourselves. I think it's ego crap. Personally. I, 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 if, I, if, yeah. To me, it feels like oh, we, don't, no. we, don't want to, we don't want to say, even though it's not true, I feel like a little bit is, well, we don't want to bet the whole farm on Linux because maybe right. 10 years down the road, Linux is going to die and we want to be able to, be, we want to be a, this portable system that will move to whatever becomes the new king. Like It's almost like an, a, a fear to commit to yeah. Linux in a sense, even though it sounds ridiculous. That's almost what it sounds like to me when I look at it. I don't know if well, it is principles. Is- I feel like principles is a way to cover up that fear. Unless they can cite something con- concrete besides ego stroking, I'm I'm just not buying I mean, into system, the whole. You know? System D stuff is already coming through on yeah. SID and testing, so I mean, we all know yeah. that they're going to go System D. Well, I don't actually know. It's not looking like they are going to go with System D. I don't think you think they're going to do Upstart? Or? Well, I'm not. No, they're going to open RC. I thought. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what they're going to well, go with, but now it's it's looking like, uh, according to what I read on the Linux WN uh, over the weekend, it looks like they're not going the System D direction mm. i think it's interesting that when you introduced this you said um you know maybe if debian had a mark shuttleworth type person or a you know benevolent dictator that this might not happen but that the fact is that even the ubuntu project has a technical board and they have discussions like this and mark doesn't swoop in and you know kick everyone to one side and say nope this will be the way it happens take for example an, a discussion happening just this week about whether we should re-enable uh, suspend to disk on Ubuntu and the whole technical board are weighing in on the pros and cons of re-enabling that thing. So, and I, so I think all Debian are doing is the same kind of thing that the Ubuntu technical board would do, which is evaluate all the options given their principles and make a decision based on technical and other merits. That is true. However, what and Mark has- a very public thing. What very Ma- public. Mark has- And they the- don't have timescales like, like, you know, yeah. they, don't, they don't have a release date like we do. I think, but see, Mark can set the tone, right? Mark can say convergence is the future, and then that frames the conversation that everybody has from that point. And just that ability is huge because it, you you fundamentally alter the state of the conversation that the group has when you set the cadence like that. And Debian doesn't degree. have that. To some degree, but they, they have their free software guidelines. They have their principles. They, they have... Uh, a long history of, you know, doing the right thing. And I think they want to continue doing the right thing, whether that means it's system D or upstart, you know, they, they want to do the right thing. And I, 
I think their influence is just not one guy or a set of contracts that Canonical may have with OEMs. It's principles that I, they have. I, they I could agree. Uh, see, at what point do you reevaluate the principles? Because it almost seems like insanity to me to to make this level of sacrifice just to maintain compatibility with BSD. When in reality, do you know anybody that runs Debian BSD in large scale production? No, it doesn't happen. It, it is it's a it's a it's 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 a dream. It's it's a hope that the Debian project could get utilized for something that the BSD guys have already got covered. They're pretty happy with their package management and they're going off doing their own thing anyways. It seems like Debian's principles drive them to aspire to something that is ludicrous. Well, you know, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how it turns out. I, at this point, unless I can actually see a working table citing exactly what the hell they're dragging their feet with and why, um, because for, for just the average guy looking into this, it, it's, it's just it's mind-boggling. It's just like, oh, my God, make a decision already. You know, I mean, seriously. I feel like – But this isn't, you know, this isn't the first time that the, the Debian Oh, no, Debian's of, famous for it. And, know, but, it have, but it does kind of get old after a while, though. Well, it does. Well, the in problem, the, in the, the problem of, is – they are not just five guys, they are several hundred oh, guys, and they yeah. just have different opinions, and they need yeah. to talk about it. Never heard it's fine, chefs in the by the way. It's absolutely <laughs> fine, by the but way. it is good. Because I, I don't mean to keep cutting you off, but I want to, uh, you, I want to respond to each point you're making. Um, it, it, that is true it, to an extent, but it also allows for stagnation, and it allows for um, a washing down to the lowest common denominator. And instead of making something amazing and streamlined, you can make something that makes everybody happy. And I talked about this with Gnome um, on the Linux Action Show, is when you have design by community, you really get something that's not that great. And when you have design... Mm -hmm. I, well, you, Sorry, uh, that was. No, no, you're, I'll, I didn't say it. Uh, so, uh, you, but you are making my point for me. It is exactly that, and I, I feel like you could apply that that scenario to Debian. Is they as the larger the community gets, the more discussions that happen. It, it actually turns out that the more arbitrary aspects of the community are able to wield a larger uh, influence. And you, I think if 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 this could be streamlined the pace of innovation would be a lot higher. It slows us down a lot. It really weighs things down, well, I think. Well, Chris, wait, 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 wait. The first thing you need to remember is either way, it really does not matter how the outcome is in this um, discussion. System D is already in Debian, as is Upstart. And OpenIC, I don't know if OpenRC is in it. But it doesn't really matter how the outcome is because both init systems are already in Debian. True. So you can choose whether you want it or not but we do know that the default discussion is, is just a, yes the discussion is just about the default right but and i end, but i think that's just as good as that is just as good as only having one years. so and also I, I, don't forget ahead, the the what you're what we're all navel gazing and um <laughs> yeah. bike, bike bike shedding about <laughs> this same thing will have will have been happening on that mailing list over the years and nobody would have been looking at it there would have been no twitter there would have been minimal podcasts there wouldn't have been you know everyone sharing t on twitter links to oh so and so said this on the debian project mailing list because nobody cares um, uh, or the people who do care are the people who are already on that list and having those discussions. Right. It's the it's the sharp focus of you know the the twenty four hour news, the the Twitter generation of people who are, um, you know, having an opinion and want to express that opinion rapidly and in one hundred and forty characters. When in fact that's not how Debian works, and I right. don't think Debian should work. That I way. think what it what it is is we are reaching an influx point in Linux where um, I was just talking about this in Coda Radio where. The, the, the core between the distributions with System D uh, and a lot of other things, uh, you know, big changes in the kernel too, is becoming less and less chaotic. It's actually becoming, we could see a future where developers don't look at Linux as this crazy wild west of all of these different fractured, I mean, you talk about Android frag fragmentation, let's talk about distro fragmentation for a minute, but that is kind of coming together. It's kind of congealing a little bit. And Debian is now at a crossroads where they could choose to go down that path or they could choose to be fragmented and different. And the 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 hope is because Debian is so important to all the people built off of it and because Debian is such a critical distro to Linux itself, I, I want to see more great development come into Linux. And I feel like the more consistency we have there in the, in the middle of these distros, 
the better the better time and we're going to have from our dev, you know the better applications we're going to get the more applications we're going to get the more people that will target linux and the more fractured we are the less likely that's going to happen you're going to continue to see software that only works on red hat or software that only works on ubuntu yep. And that's we're what I think people to hear are worried about. Laundry list of reasons why it's a benefit. Right. It's great and it's awesome and all go all this choice. Yeah. I'm sure we can't get any two things to run the same way in the same distro. See, but that's such a critical it's, thing. It's, and it's uh, like if you know, annoying. if we have if we have a future in which we can start to smooth some of those differences out, I yeah. I, I, I I don't wanna I don't wanna, you know, sacrifice something important to get there, but I also want to make sure that if we don't go that direction, we have some damn really good reasons. Like I mean Hold really on, good. Yeah. I, I just want to say, um, really good. Go ahead. I think people are just making this out to be way more of a big deal than it is. Because remember when Arch switched to System B, everybody just went insane. Yeah, I remember that. Two months later, it was like, oh, yeah, that happened. It's a, hey, big, it's a bigger we, deal, though. Remember when we moved the buttons over to the left hand side? <laughs> what absolute shitstorm yeah, happened well, there? Da, da, da. You yeah, moved my buttons. Yeah, yeah. Or remember when well, the skies the, uh, opened up? Or and remember when we uh, switched to uh, Pulse Audio? Well, that was kind of crappy uh, at first. Yeah. So, but I think this the stakes are a little bit different in this one because it's more about what future Linux is going to look like and how compatible each distro is going to be with each other. And you know, if skills learned in one distro, like how to stop and start services are applicable to another distro. And those small little things, like all to, to us, us, those of us who use Linux on a regular basis, they seem trivial. But people who are maybe like a Windows admin for their whole career and now they've just got Linux boxes, these are the little details that make night and day difference for them. And anytime you know, we can reduce the differentiation between the different uh, distros, the better it's going to be for all Linux adoption as a whole. And, and I just... I, I I appreciate that they're they have a lot of technical requirements and uh, and principles to follow, and that's what makes Debian as good as it is. But I guess I I have to wonder again if you took out the community element of the decision making process and you just put a CEO in there, I think he would come down pretty handedly on the system D side of the discussion. Are people well, really are arguing for benevolent Debian. dictatorship and to import this corporate Borg into Debian? Really? No, no. I mean, I wouldn't want that. No, no I, group I, thing I, is group thing is this. not a problem. Like people look at group thing as horrible, and it's it's great, and it also it's 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 it got a massive flaws. But if you had like say a board of three people that were um, in control of the group thing and saying this is the direction we're looking at, and then they have like a mediation situation, then you could you basically get input from everyone, but at the same time, and and you get I mean you give input, but you also get like. Do you give everybody who's putting their input as a, a valid, you know, they have the same amount of input or the same, uh, their their merit is the same. They don't have any kind of skewed. If you have a CEO, then everybody's just going to listen to the CEO and then their the opinions are going to just dwindle. Yeah, I mean, the technical board is, I think, probably the right answer, I guess. Um, I just look at this. We actually got a, a really good email in on this that really kind of, I thought, did a good job. It came from Kyle and... Uh, you guys can you can feel free if you if you think Kyle's off the rails to to interrupt. But uh, he wrote, um, "I'm writing regarding your question in this week's Linux Unplugged about whether Linux has too much endless squabbling and consensus decision making that inhibits innovation versus a top down organization like Apple or Canonical that can follow a singular vision." Oh, don't get Popey started again. Essentially, your question comes down to an argument of the merits of democracy versus dictatorship. While I appreciate you raising the question, I have to say the implication the implications of your argument seem to distinctly be negative. In the freedom dimension. Oh, hold on. It's negative in the freedom there we go. dimension. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, <laughs> I got I to gotta bust it out. I think your question doesn't just have to do with innovation, but also the common argument that Linux is bad because debates within the community are too heated. I'm sure many others will write in with technical or practical opinions on this question, but I thought I'd bring in a little bit of political theory since I have a liberal arts background that others might not. I would argue the Linux community is like a Roman Rep is like the Roman Republic. It has its own sorts of dictators, consuls, tribunes, and any number of other competing powers. It has an armed citizenry, just like Rome did, where mm -hmm. users are largely free to contribute code and start projects, and it is driven by a chaotic political structure that leads to competition and expansion. Like the Spartans, Apple is careful in its expansion plans, choosing to occupy particular upscale segments of the market, and it certainly has a lot of success with that. Like the Leonians, or Leonians, the, the, the 300, Apple elite has elite 
Uh, Apple's elite of workers could be said to punch above their weight in terms of innovation. But when you look at the big picture in terms of install base and not just the direct market value, Apple is dwarfed by the chaotic, Hydra-like expansion of Linux and open source. Our liberty is the condition for our success. We are positive in the size dimension because we are positive in the freedom dimension. So just as Romans occasionally found the need to elect dictators to lead them, we may occasionally find the need for executive powers to get things done. But let our envy of Apple not lead us to expand these islands of tyranny to the point that they crush the liberty that makes Linux so great. I agree with a lot of what they said. I, re- I cringed when he used Romans as an example because I, for one, enjoy my, uh, my Roman citizenship. <laughs> oh, wait, that's right. We're not because it collapsed. <laughs> right. Um, you know, well, so you I, never I, know. <laughs> I, I, like some of the, I like some of the things he said, but man, I was just cringing the whole time with the whole Rome thing because it's like bad example. Bad hey, this example. is why Debbie wants no, to keep that BSD going. Oh, horrible, horrible, horrible. Rome, Rome was moved to Byzant- to, uh, B- over to Byzantium. Uh, the capital, Rome, was moved to Constantinople by Constantine, and it's just propaganda basically propaganda um, by Roman Catholics or whatever that it's been collapsed, but it lasted for a long time before it, it was It lasted for a long time, and it had an, it, it, it brought forth amazing successes, as did Greece and a lot of other uh, other things, but empires fall. I mean, at the end of the day, that's, so, that's I, what, kind of the point. The, well, the parallel Kyle was drawing there is that uh, the, uh, the essentially chaotic and sometimes competitive nature of the political structure of Linux sort of yeah. leads to its always growing expansion into new areas and new territories. G- agree with that, yeah. No, I agree with the points. I yeah. just, the, the whole Rome thing just really rubbing the wrong way. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I think you're right. missing a bigger point here too is Linux is not bigger than any one distro. Like it's a kernel. So it doesn't matter what one distro does. Exactly. There's yeah, always going to be another distro yeah. that replaces. Yeah. And I'll this tell you, true. the other thing I've really noticed over the years of doing these shows is the things that seem like the biggest, biggest technical upsets or the, you know, the thing that we really got to be concerned about have yet to ever actually be that. Um, you know, like I look back yep. at, you remember the amount of upset around Novell signing that deal with Microsoft? Oh, I mean, yeah. it was like, we did like yeah. three weeks of coverage on the Linux yeah. Action Show back to back to back discussing yeah. that issue because it was so red hot, right? Um, or, you know, a lot of other things that uh, uh, has happened in the past always seem like these X-11 massive problems. Wayland. Yeah, everything, right? And then like, so so say, say Debian doesn't choose system D. Hey, somebody will just figure out a way to still make things compatible and work. I mean, we all, that's what happens, right? Every time. Uh, but it is interesting to sort of look at this and think that every now and then I wonder how much further would we be if we had a few more uh, benevolent dictators in these communities? Because I think where you do see real progress made in open source is these little uh, fiefdoms we have of like, you know, here's Camp Apache over here. Uh, you know, here's Camp Ubuntu, there's Camp Fedora, there's Camp, you know, or even more, even more granular than that, there's Camp System D, and they have their, they have their sort of appointed um, chiefs that sort of push them forward, and then as a collective whole, we all benefit. But it, it's kind of like in a way, the body all works together. It's sort of this weird organic creature that has some some ugly spots that we all get to just look at and watch because it's all happening out in the open. I've also, I've often made the point that if these these types of discussions happen at the Microsofts and at the Apples and the Oracles of, of the world, but they're all done behind closed doors. So we have no idea where the way those conversations went. This is true. I, this is true. I also think that the um, open way of doing things is more holistic. Sure, it may not be as fast, but it's definitely more holistic in the way it grows. Hey, yeah. uh, I wanted to shift gears. I, while we got the mumble room here, what do you guys think about uh, the CentOS team joining Red Hat? What do you think that means? Nobody. Awesome. I don't know for, whether I'm happy hope, that or I, scared. Yeah. It's uh, it's also the way they say it. They talk about it. It sounds like it's going to be a fun a backing of of the CentOS project, not necessarily an not, overtaking. Um, gonna make it for uh, sale and uh, kill the CentOS team in the process. Yeah, right. I know it's, it's, if it's yeah. Yeah. financial either. backing, it's a good thing. But yeah. if it's a complete redo of their initiatives, it's it's going to turn the project well, into it, something else. They made it sound oh. like it's going to keep going as is. But the part I'm wondering is what what we kind of what I talked about during the Fedora 20 review is the Fedora project is redoing. You know, they got Fedora next and they're talking in that proposal about potentially having a server spin of Fedora. And I, at the time I looked at that and go, that sounds like a CentOS competitor. And I wonder if maybe there's some 
some sort of collaboration that might happen there, but I just don't know. Is it is it more of a uh, Ubuntu server competitor in the cloud space? Not so much the server space, but the cloud space. That's what they like. And is, it, yeah. this, is this Red Hat buying themselves into that space? That, that's what I'm wondering, right? Because CentOS has huge deployments in a lot of the cloud services and cloud hosting. It's like so, I use CentOS. So I, I don't <laughs> think Fedora will ever um, directly compete with CentOS in the server market just because they target different... Um, different areas. I mean, I guess Fedora could work well as um, as in the cloud space, but CentOS is a much more conserved distribution than Fedora is. Right. And right. so it will act more like an Ubuntu LTS or RHEL itself. Because I've been in companies where we're still using RHEL 5 and it's still, su- or uh, CentOS 5 and it's still supported. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to upgrade versions because it's such a huge effort to do so. And if you're on Fedora, if they have the current release cycle and they're releasing every I guess they really six months, right? Um, it would be impossible to support that. Yeah, I, I think, uh, so the way they're working this in Fedora Next is they're going to have like rings where the first ring will be like the cloud version of Fedora that sees more conservative changes. And then there'll be the set of stuff on top of that. That's the next ring. Maybe it's like more network services. And then there's a third ring, which is like the desktop services that sit on top of that. And the idea is, is you could pull out just that middle ring and you would have just a very minimal core uh literally you're going to call it Fedora Core again. Um, and then that could be their hope, I think, is to have that be server ready, to make that make that core not change that much. And that would be what people deploy, like on DigitalOcean VPSs and, and other places. Uh, and it it is kind of like, uh, you got to figure, uh, Red Hat's been sitting back and watching Ubuntu eat its lunch on, like a lot, on, on EC2 and a lot of Rackspace uh, deployments. I mean, Red Hat is has a presence there, but they're not staying competitive with the LTSs with, with the LTS Ubuntu releases. So, I think the big picture is is it's probably c- to compete there, but I don't see exactly how. It's good news for the CentOS team, I think. It's going to be interesting, and it's one of these things where I'm not quite sure if the audience is that interested because it's all server stuff. So it, it yanks it's my chain because yeah. I used to be a server guy, and I don't know if it really. Well, if if CentOS becomes a you know a, a really uh, popular option in the cloud space then red hat have an upsell there you know pretty easily yeah. to go in the, in the same way that oracle upsell from mysql to oracle database you can upsell from centos to rel licenses yeah it, totally it, it seems a no-brainer for them yeah really that that aspect of it totally makes sense that's exactly what it is uh and yeah that's probably going to work Red Hat's going to make more money. Surprise, surprise, everybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> Red, Red Hat doing this is actually interesting for CentOS, too, because the Red Hat was t- was making it harder for CentOS to make their, using this, the Red Hat source code to make it. They modulized everything, and they made it, like, piece by piece. They, that CentOS had, Cento had to, to, to get past the legal issues, they had to uh, kind of... Uh, put a lot of effort into making each release. So now maybe CentOS could actually improve, like, how fast they do things so it, they can make and make it easier thanks to red hat pr- uh, funding it then yeah. so it's into west could actually improve a lot of uh, in a lot of ways very quickly i wonder so in a post nsa revelations world where we know there's distributions out there like isn't red linux that chinese linux distribution that's based off centos and they wanted a distro that wasn't attached to a u.s company that's why they spun that i wonder how that impacts stuff like that now Fork maybe yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe a fork. Yeah, they could just fork it and maintain it. Maybe the, maybe it's not a big deal. Yeah, but CentOS was just a hack. Well, not yeah, really. it was. It 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 didn't. It wasn't compatible with Red Hat. And anybody I know that was running it what? in uh, production, I told them absolutely not. Well, well, what, what are you way? talking about? It's entirely it is compatible. compatible. Yeah, I, that it's, doesn't. It's entirely right. binary the whole compatible. Point of CentOS. <laughs> but what way have you found Don that it's not compatible? Uh, mostly upgrades and packages that were uh, critical to Red Hat EL um, and trying to run some applications that were uh, suggested for Red Hat EL, uh, oh. trying to run it in CentOS. It, it was just a nightmare. I haven't experienced something. I know I've actually had been pretty fortunate. I have, I've even gone as far as taking like, I can't, I'm, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but I took like a CentOS 5 installation um, or I'm sorry, I took a Red Hat 5 installation and repointed the repos over to CentOS 6, and I actually upgraded 
the release of that installation of CentOS 5 to Red Hat, or, I'm sorry, from Red Hat 5 to CentOS 6. Like I went to a whole new version and switched oh, from wow. Red Hat to CentOS. It's not recommended, but I there was this server where there was just absolutely no option other than that. And I did it. And it, I was like amazed to me. I was stunned because I went from Red Hat 5 to CentOS 6 and I changed right. repos and all that kind of stuff. So there I would been quite successful. But I, I suppose you could always have an, uh, uh, an application that would maybe double check to make sure it's on Red Hat Enterprise Linux and then just kick you up a refusal to operate? Is that what you ran into, Don? Uh, I don't think it was anything in the app itself. It definitely had something to do with libraries oh, that okay. were okay. renamed and, you know, re-labeled you know, oh, really? kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, Maybe to take out the branding or whatever in like a file name or something. Huh. Plus I had a major problem trying to go from 5, 8 or whatever up to 6 something. There just wasn't an easy way to upgrade. There you go. Well, there you go. I, that's a, that's a good, a good little piece of feedback. And thanks to uh, the Jack in the Box too for voicing yeah. a good uh, dissent there. Because you know, I mean, he, he brought up good points in defending Debian. Uh, and and my only, I guess, my closing my closing argument would be is Debian's got to do what's good for Debian and whatever that yeah, is. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I don't know enough about what they do to make any broad judgments i just i just would like to see them kind of pick their direction and embrace it and, would, and then continue to crawl along at a snail's pace as usual i would love to see um, them choose awesome. something that uh makes so. debian work better with linux at, at a whole yeah. and i would love to see them not make a bad decision just because they're not questioning principles from time to time but yeah. as long as those things aren't happening i'm i'm, hey. I'm a happy hey, they're happy i'm whatever happy. they go with right sure I, yeah i had something to say about that too because i come from the unix side mm -hmm. um you know, I'm I'm all for System D. I use it in Arch and everything. It's something new. Um, I don't see why Debian should be, uh, you know, holding back. Um, my problem is that now Linux is sort of getting away from the init RC world, right? And you know, now I'm I'm in the Unix side doing RC, and now I got to come up with a whole different. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> there is that. It's, it is a big change. It is a lot different. But uh, all right, guys. Well, good show. Thank you very much for all of the inputs. That was a good discussion. And we'll have links to the stuff we talked about, like a Q5 Sys uh, Yasipai uh, or Yasipai uh, turnkey solution. Maybe go back him if you like the idea. And uh, we also have a link to that CentOS news. And we'll have further discussion about all the stuff that happened at CES, Matt, uh, coming up on Sunday, including nice. the Steambox stuff. Steambox stuff Ooh. will just be part of our overall coverage. So it should be a great show. Uh, assuming uh, Chase's flight isn't delayed, he'll be joining us to cover what he saw. He's uh, on the floor right now at CES. So we'll have a great wrap of that. Following all that, if you see some good CES stories uh, that are Linux-related, please link them up in the Linux Action Show subreddit. I'd love to go through that uh, as we're uh, preparing our coverage. So, Matt, have a great week, and I'll see you on Sunday, okay? All right, see you then. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us this week. Don't forget you can email us. Just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and pop that contact link and join us live on a Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv and jblive.info for the audio edition. All right, everyone, have a great week, and we'll see you on Sunday. And if not, we'll see you right back here next Tuesday. Tuesday.